centrifugal. All right. Oh. Huh? I thought it was too <laughs> Okay, so here's what we have left in the second nine weeks. So we've got centripetal motion and uh, gravity. Those basically go hand in hand. So there's that test. Then we've got momentum, linear and angular. So there's the second big test. Then we've got uh, work and energy. That's the third big test. And then it kind of gets weird depending on how the end of the term plays out. Uh, but those are for certain the big tests that you're going to have. And then we've got like thermodynamics and gas laws and buoyancy, kind of a hodgepodge at the end. And then uh, that last week you'll have, or I'll tell you right now, here, the last week the school will play out, is that that Monday we'll review, Tuesday would be the written final worth 15% of your grade, and then you have a three-day lab final, which goes Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So that'll be the last week. So if you really want to plan ahead, or, you know, arrange your Christmas shopping early, <laughs> that's how the last week will play out, barring any snowstorms or, you know, anything like that. Okay, so let's talk circular motion. So let's kind of back up a little bit. So, velocity is a vector quantity, which means it has both magnitude and direction. Now, everything that we've talked about so far has been dealing with changing the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay? So if you look at the, the gas pedal on your car, What's the purpose of the gas pedal of your car? To accelerate the car. To do what with your velocity vector? Change the magnitude. Yeah. yeah, change the magnitude. Make the magnitude bigger. What's the function of your brake? Make it small. Make it right? Okay. So the function of the steering wheel then is to turn it and change the direction of the magnitude vector. Okay? So Here's what we've got. You have a brake, you have a gas pedal. Those change the magnitude. Then you've got a steering wheel, which is going to change the direction. So, let's go to the back and let's look at what's going to happen. Okay, so I don't think so. Shark? All right. So, here's what we've got. We've got a little uh, 20 gram mass hanging from the end of the string. And we have this, which is called a liquid accelerometer. Okay, so I know that isn't like blood or anything inside of it. It's just sweet. so. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let go of it, and then we're going to see what's going to happen. So when I let go of it, first off, is it going to accelerate? Yep. Yes, because we have an imbalanced net force. Yes. <laughs> so here's the question. When I let go of it, one of three things could happen. The liquid could move forward in here, the liquid could move backward, or the liquid could just stay level. Backward. Just, okay, you've answered enough. You got it. Okay? No more answers. Kyle, what's it going to do? Why? Backward. Why? Because Eric said so. Me. Help Kyle out. <laughs> Does it have to do with density? No. Not really. Inertia. It does have to do with inertia. Because would the liquid want to stay in place, but the car will make it move forward, so it'll go backwards. Okay. You're ninety-nine percent right. Ooh. Good enough. Good, good enough. <laughs> That's a pretty solid answer. Pretty <laughs> solid answer. Okay. So let's, first off, let's just see what happens when I let go. So we're here. I let go. Okay. Moved a little bit, okay? Had a little bit of a distortion to it. So, do it again, all right? So it changed just a little bit. Now, if I take off the 20 gram, help me out there, thank you. And let's put on a 200 gram. <laughs> go big or go home. <laughs> Okay. All right. 
So now we'll try it with 200 gram. Ooh. Whoa. It's barely stopped. Yeah. So, right. so great. Right. Help him out. Stop it. So here's the deal. <laughs> so the question is, is there something inside or something in front of it that's pushing it back? The wall. Hmm. Now, let riddle me this. What would happen if I let go of this, and at the exact instant that I let go of it, I make the back of this container go away? It's going to spill. What would the liquid do? Stay the same yeah, it would just stay there, right? And so oh, it would spill, but in reality, it's just that there wouldn't be anything to make it accelerate. So. Here's the whole key to this. When this happens, there's nothing pushing it to the back. It just wants to remain at rest. Okay? Inclinatio ad quidditum. Yes. It just wants to remain at rest. So without an outside force acting on it, that liquid would just stay there. So here's what's important. I'm not pushing it to the back. It just wants to stay there, and the wall is forcing it to go forward. Now, same thing happens if you're in a car. If you're in a car and you press down on the gas pedal, you feel like you're being pushed back into your seat. Are you actually being pushed back into your seat? No, there's nothing in, front, in the steering wheel pushing you backwards. Your body just wants to remain at rest. What you feel is the seat pushing you forward, and that reaction action force that's what you feel. But there's nothing in front of the car pushing you. Now, something important. When I let go of it, the force is obviously acting in this direction. That's the direction of the acceleration, right? So here's the question. Which way does the water move? In the same direction of the force or in the opposite direction of the force? Opposite. Opposite. Okay, so when I let go of it, right, it moves in the opposite direction of the applied force. So this moves in the opposite direction of acceleration. Now, if I don't have very much mass, I don't have very much acceleration, this doesn't move very much. So actually, if you know this angle, it's kind of a cool deal. If you can measure this angle and take the sign of it, that gives you your value of your acceleration. So if you happen to have one of these riding around in your car, and someone presses on the gas pedal and you can like record how the angle of it, you can determine the acceleration of the car by taking the sign of the angle of that liquid. Okay, so here's what you need to remember. The water moves in the opposite direction of the acceleration. Okay, got it? Good? Fantastic. All right, back to you. So if I take this rubber stopper and swing it around over my head like this, so once I get it up to speed, okay, once I get it up to speed, is the rubber stopper accelerating? <coughs> no. No? This is a 50-50 shot. Yeah, that's why I was going I'm going to say no. Okay, so how many think the rubber stopper is accelerating? When it's at the speed that you... Yeah, what, like right now. At, at, not not while I'm getting it up to speed. But I'm talking about once I get it up. To, once I get it to this point, is it move? So how many think it is accelerating? Raise your hand if you think it's accelerating right now. Don't you do it, Sam. One, two, three. So how many think it's not accelerating? The rest of you? Okay, good. Most of you voted. I love America. Nice. Okay, in Chicago, you could vote three times. All right. No, it's true. Okay. So, <laughs> Chicago is known for rigging votes. Yeah, the famous one. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with this argument. So, Kendra, come up here. Oh, no. You can handle it. Okay. You can handle it. Um, so all you have to do is sit in the chair. Okay. Okay. So move that, move that over. Okay. Now all you have to do is sit in the chair. Okay. So you, you want to hold that thing out. Okay. Now, so what's going to happen is that I'm going to spin Kendra. 
and she's going to hold the accelerometer out. So the vast majority of you said that it doesn't accelerate when you move in a circle. Okay? So if that's true, what should the water level do? It should say completely low. No, I wouldn't change my answer. No, no, no. Okay? Sure, it's the same. All right, well, she yeah, can't move. Can. She can't move. She's, she's going to be because you're changing direction. direction. Okay, and I the got velocity it. isn't the same because you, can't get you have different direction. No, this is this is after this is after I get a spinning. Okay? Yeah, it is going to accelerate the beginning because I got to take the press. But I'm talking about after I get her up to speed. Yeah, but that's oh, not constant. If I were <laughs> yeah, will be. No, not like it. this. Sure, will be. No. How? Okay, because I'm just doing this. Like I was doing this, I'm pushing her to constant speed. Yeah, no, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Are you ready? Okay, so hold, hold it out like this. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Yeah.
So basically, we've got to narrow it down to B or C. So B kind of moves so that that thing can... Ah, this will work. Okay. Okay, so we're doing it again, just make sure that. Oh, cool. no. <laughs> Score! Okay, so here's the question. Why did it go with the stomach pad? Because the force is stuck. Okay, we stopped the force. You stopped the force and watch. So it is when for those of you that voted C, it's like you kind of thought, well, it's almost like it's going to kind of remember the force, but yet it wants to go in a straight line, but there's still some residual <laughs> force acting on it. Mm, maybe yes, maybe no. That's what I'm saying. Okay? That's, that's exactly what That's what you were thinking, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So but here's the deal. As soon as it leaves that edge, are there any forces acting on it to cause it to change direction? No. So therefore, you stop the force and you watch. And what's going to happen? It's going to move in a straight Now, it didn't slow down because there wasn't friction. It didn't move in a circle because there was no force acting on it. Got it? Good? Grant? Okay. Is that me? Yes. Thank you. Did my hair do that well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it right now. Do it right now. Do it right now. Oh, you made it long. Break my rule. Great, great. <laughs> no, they broke two of them. Yeah, not here. Not right now. Do it later. Not on my time. I'm keeping it. This is my rule. <laughs> okay. Hey, good luck. That's easy. Start it up. We're going? <laughs> all right. So here we have Kendra. Hi, Kendra. Blonde hair and all, right? Yep. And she was spinning. Now, when she was spinning, what, was, what did the water do? Did it move to the outside or did it move toward the inside? Oh, okay. So here's what's important. The water level in the accelerometer did this. Okay. Now, the water moves in the same direction as the acceleration or the opposite direction of the acceleration? Opposite. Opposite. So what was the direction of the acceleration? Towards inward. Oh, so it's slowing. Okay. Now don't get slowing down into this. Like, because when you let it go, it makes it slow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So here's the deal. The direction of this acceleration, and we put A sub C, which stands for centripetal acceleration, and not centrifugal. Centripetal comes from the Greek word meaning inward seeking. Okay. Centrifugal means outward seeking. Okay. So here's my point. When Kendra is moving around like this and she's holding this, there's no force on the inside pushing the water to the outside. The water just wants to move in a straight line. The same thing is true of this. When I swing this rubber stopper over my head, is there any force from the center of my hand acting outward to push the rubber stopper in that direction? No, it doesn't make any sense. It isn't like, oh, I swing it around and now my hand, once it starts to move, my hand emanates this magic force that you can't see that pushes the rubber stopper to the outside. It doesn't seem logical. So what happens is that when I do swing it around, I do have to exert a force because as soon as I stop the force, it goes in a straight line, right? So if you stop the force and watch, it takes a straight line path because of the first law of inertia. So if you look at this rubber stopper from the top, so here and then here, okay, here, here, okay. Here's the whole point. At any given instant, if you stop applying the force, this thing goes off in a straight line. Okay, so this instantaneous velocity vector always points in a straight line. It's never kind of a curve. It always wants to go off in a straight line. So that force 
and that centripetal acceleration are both pointing inward and at right angles to the velocity vector. If you're over here, your velocity vector is here, your centripetal force and your centripetal acceleration are here. So if I ever ask you, and I will, what's the direction of the centripetal force and the centripetal acceleration, you tell me it's inward and at a right angle to the velocity vector. Okay? Those are the two parts. You just can't say, oh, it's pointing in. There's two parts to that answer. It's inward and at a right angle to the velocity vector. But here's the problem with this. It doesn't match with what you experience, and I'll show you why. So let's say uh, that Ellie goes and buys a Jeep, okay? Hunter, Hunter right? no, 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 actually Hunter bought a Jeep. I, my story. Like, well, I mean, I'm happy. Like, okay. like, so Ellie goes and buys a Jeep, right? Hunter. And before we put big tires on it. Oh, yeah. Mine has to be tired. Yeah, mine has to be tired. Okay, good. <laughs> this is blue. Okay, a blue Jeep. This is looking down from on top. Now, here's the problem with centripetal force, is that it doesn't make sense, and I'll tell you why. So, Ellie's driving along, right, being safe with both hands on the wheel, at, you know, 10 and 2. 10 and 2, okay, driving along, being very safe. And Ellie takes a hard right turn. Okay? Okay? Takes a hard right turn. Now, here's the problem. And Ellie's the only one that gets the answer to this because Ellie's the only one driving. What do you feel inside of this Jeep? <coughs> yes. So if you're Ellie inside this Jeep, you feel like there is something inside of the Jeep pushing you against the car door. Okay? You do. You, you get that sensation. That's the whole idea of centrifugal force, meaning that it's outward seeking. Now, it fails if you think about it logically. So if you go, man, I was being pushed against the car door. Okay? Let's think this through for just a second. So, this source of this force is invisible, okay, it isn't like there's some, mag there's, it isn't like there's a box inside the car that automatically emits this force that pushes against you that you can't see. And the beauty of it is, is that it only exists when you're turning. It isn't like this thing is pushing you against the car door all the time. So it only exists when you're turning, and it senses how fast you're going, and the radius. So if you're going really, really fast and you take a tight radius, then you go, oh, it's pushing me really, really hard, okay? But if I kind of take a slow, gentle turn, kind of do the grandma thing, then it's there, but it's not quite as much. So here's the problem. The problem. There's the problem. <laughs> is that if you're Ellie and you say, hey, Ellie, what happened? You go, oh, I was pushed against the car door. So within her frame of reference, say, stay there. Do not even try and get that golf ball. It's not even in that direction, too. Like, All right, so what do you call this? You're exerting centripetal force. Because right. you are exerting an inward force. Is this a trivial? Yeah. Why is this different from a car turn? What? Why is this different <laughs> from that? Okay. Hold on. Okay. Now, we won't do this to <laughs> Ellie because Ellie's a nice person. But imagine this. Ellie is driving and there is no door on the Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> the seats are frictionless, okay? Frictionless seats and no seat belt, okay? So Ellie takes this exact same turn. Now, here's the deal. Is there anything that's going, and, you're, and we're outside looking in. So here's the question. Is there anything that's going to push Ellie to the outside? 
Will there be a force pushing her to the outside? No. No. Yeah. Ellie, what's the only thing you want to do? Hold on to the steering wheel. Okay. <laughs> okay. But let's say you let's say even the steering wheel was frictionless. So you're just going to move in a straight line. Nothing will push your nothing will push her out. She just moves in a straight line. So what she experiences as that car door and she feels like she's being pushed, there's nothing pushing her there. She just wants to move in a straight line. It's like if Reese was sitting here and I came up behind him and I pushed him really, really hard. There would be nothing in front of Reese pushing him backward. He just wants to remain at rest. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true of Ellie when she takes his turn. There's just, there's just the car door forcing her to travel in a curved path because she has inertia. She wants to move in a straight line. So within the car, you feel like you're being pushed against the car door within the frame of reference of the car. But if you're an outside observer, if you're just watching this, you're up, you're in a balloon up above watching this, and you see Ellie make this turn, you're going, she just wants to move in a straight line. So something has to provide the force to make her move in a straight path. Okay? Got the idea. So if you're Ellie, you say, oh, there's centrifugal force because you feel like you're being pushed from the outside, from the inside out. In reality, that doesn't exist. You're about oh. annoying today. All right. Stop. <laughs> so let's talk. <laughs> so funny. Oh, I'm so dead. Oh. Do we ever learn about the the Google one? No. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's what it was just on the screen. Oh, never mind. We, you, That's from you, the you inside out. You experience, yeah. okay. but there's nothing inside the car no, pushing you against the outside. Okay. So there's no now, here, Eric, I need that. I guess not. Watch out, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Right. No, swing it, and then the no. centripetal force do its thing. You're a comedic genius, Mr. Robert Camp. I am not even kidding. Say? I've been crying for like the past two minutes. What do you say? With a big dog towel. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let like the big dogs howl. That's genius. <laughs> <laughs> he circled that on my paper and I couldn't think it. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so. When you look at the four fundamental forces, electromagnetic, strong nuclear, weak nuclear gravity, you'll notice that centripetal force is not one of the four fundamental forces. So here's the anomaly about centripetal force. Centripetal force only ever exists because of something else, because you have a string holding it in motion. You have a car door pushing against Ellie you have the Earth traveling around the Sun in a gravitational field. So centripetal force never, ever, ever exists by itself. It, something has to be there to causing. So if you see an object moving in a curved path, whether it's the Moon, the Earth, the Milky Way galaxy spinning around a common center, something has to be there. It's not going to travel in a circular path by itself. Now, this is in contrast to the thinkings of Aristotle. Aristotle was all about natural states, hence the <coughs> inclinational ad quitum. He says, okay, the natural state for objects on Earth is to come to rest. That's its natural state. And if you want, and if you want it to not move in a circle or, in a, or slow down, you have to keep applying the force. So the same thing is true with this rubber stopper. This rubber stopper doesn't want to move in a circular the path. Rubber stopper wants to move in a straight line. So as soon as I stop applying the force, it goes in a straight line. So now, when they looked at the heavens, if you're Aristotle, and if you look at, if you look at the moon orbiting 
the earth, the earth orbiting the sun. They said, and the stars, okay, they all move, they all appear to move in these circular paths. So they said the heavens, their natural state of motion was a circular path. Because that's the only way they could explain the moon and the stars and the sun all appearing to rise on the horizon, move across the sky in a circular path, and then set. Because if you think about it, So imagine this, and you can model this rubber stopper as being like the sun. So if this thing is moving around, I in effect see it rise over here, and then I see it move across my field of view, and then I see it set over here. So this is the exact same motion that you see when you watch the sun rise, or the moon rise, or the stars rise. They appear out of the corner of your eye, they appear to move in a circular path, and then they disappear. So they said, okay, the natural motions of the heavens then is a circular path. Because they said, okay, well that makes sense, everything moves in a circle, hey, things move in a circle up there. So, when you look at sources of centripetal forces, the first big one is friction. Okay? So let me give you a simple example. So let's say that here was an intersection, and uh, you want to make a right-hand turn. Okay? Simple, you turn the steering wheel, you make the turn, tires turn, beep, you go around the corner, life's good. Okay? No words. But what if we've had a big ice storm? Sheet of ice. <coughs> Almost, What's going to happen? Almost, the coefficient friction of friction will go down. Coefficient of friction is going to drop like a, like a rock, right? Yeah. So like let, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that there is no friction. What are you going to do? You're going to move in a straight line because there is no force available to cause an acceleration. You're just going to go, whoop, okay? Because you have inertia, that's how you want to move. There's no force, you move in a straight line. Now, the other thing that you can use is tension, okay? So that's what I'm going to use when I'm swinging this thing around. So if I swing this thing around, there's a certain amount of tension in this string. I could hook up a spring scale in here, and I could swing this thing around, and I could measure how much force it takes that is acting on that string to keep this thing moving in a circular path. Okay? So what kind of force is that? That's still centripetal force. Because no, it's acting I mean, like, which one of the basic forces is this it? Well, this is just because of the electromagnetic force of the particles and the particles being held together. Okay. Because if you don't hold the string particles together, this doesn't <coughs> happen. Okay? So here's the other option that you could do. So let's say that you're driving along and you go, wow, I've got to make this turn, but it's a sheet of ice. There's a large telephone pole here. So one option is you can kind of do the Indiana Jones thing, okay? If you happen to have like a bull whip with you, okay? So when the car gets here, take that whip, have it go around here, hold on to it really, really tight, and that will swing you around the corner. And then when you get to this point, you let go of it, and you move about on a straight line. That would work. That would work. If you could hold on to it, and the rope wouldn't break. Or if you wanted to get cool, kind of the Batman thing, you shoot out a, like a grappling hook on a steel cable that's tied to the frame of the car, wrap it around, have, have it hit this, swings around, set up the steel cable here, boom, there you go. I like Taylor's option. What's Taylor's option? Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Okay, we can do Spider-Man, okay? But it would be the exact same idea. It would come out here, wrap around something that's going to anchor it. It can provide an inward force to keep you moving in this path. Boom, you let go of it, you move in a straight line. Because unfortunately, if you don't let go of it, then you just wrap around the pole and that's going to be awkward. There's got to be some practical use for this, such as like inventions. So what can I invent? To make something move in a circle? No, like just like 
So this is a pretty cool idea. Okay, that like theory, like that centripetal really motion, right? So yeah, so like you can have centripetal clutches. What's that? What's that? See, there you go. What is that? Well, I imagine it's already been invented. Though. Yeah, it has. It's a triple it. it. But what does it do? Okay. It's more we'll talk about it. I'll give you two this. Basically, the faster it moves, the clutch changes size depending on how fast the engine is rev revved up. And then the limits, like how fast you can make it go, because it has to do with the drive and driven gear ratios. But yeah, it's already been. Yeah, I don't know. Now, your third option is gravity. That's kind of cool, right? So if you look at, here's the sun, not to scale, and here's the earth, right? We're traveling around the sun like this, and we're actually accelerating towards the sun. Don't flip out. Don't go home and your mom and dad go, so everything would have died. We're accelerating towards the earth, okay, or towards the sun, okay? That's, this is good, okay? Because the alternative is that we lose the gravitational attraction between the earth and the sun, and we go off in a straight line path just like that rubber stopper does, okay? So we want to accelerate towards the sun. That's a good thing. The alternative is that we go in a straight line and we get real cold and real dark real fast. Okay? So this is a good thing that we're accelerating towards the sun. So if you go back to the car, here's your third option. You're driving along, no friction. You have a large gravitational source, maybe a miniature black hole, appear right here. It pulls you into orbit just like the Earth orbiting the Sun, then at this, then it magically disappears, and then you continue on your straight line. So basically, those are your three options. Or there's actually a fourth option, but it really wouldn't work. If you could have people out here pushing you as you go, right? But you're going. Yes. But it doesn't have any friction to stand on either, so, so yeah, that, that wouldn't work. work. So is it like jumping? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, got the idea. Now, let's talk math. So, the basic equation, and if these are on your equation sheet, the basic idea of centripetal acceleration is that it's V squared over R. Now, let's look at the units. So, Mr. Gilchrist, what units is my velocity going to be measured in? Meters per second. Meters per second. But that's going to get squared. Then I've got a radius, which is going to be measured in meters. meters. So then I'm going to have meters squared over second squared divided by meters. One of the meters cancel well out. I get meters per second squared. Boom. I get units of acceleration meters per second squared. Good with that. Now, so if this is how we calculate centripetal acceleration, then if force equals mass times acceleration, then oddly enough, centripetal force is going to equal mass times centripetal acceleration. Okay? So, excuse that. I can take this and substitute this in here and go in the squared over R. Now, here's what this means. So, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so if I swing this pretty slowly, right, it doesn't take much force. But the faster I swing it, right, the more force it's going to take. Seems reasonable. Right? Now, if I keep the same velocity, but I make a smaller radius, what's going to happen to the amount of centripetal force? It's going to go up. Right? Now, I won't do this because it's going to break, but imagine that I take Hank the bowling ball and I tie it to this, and then I go swinging it around. Guess what? Bad things are going to happen because the string can't provide enough force. So, the more mass that you have, the more force that you need. The greater the acceleration, the more force that you need. 
the greater the velocity, the more force that you need. And if you shrink the radius, you need more force. So this is why, here's what's important, because this velocity is squared. So if, let's, let's say for example, you're driving along in a car, okay, and you're going through a neighborhood and you take a turn at say 20 miles an hour, okay? And your friends say, wow, that's cool. Let's double the speed and make it 40. We're all gonna die. <laughs> Here's the problem. If you double the velocity because it's squared, what does that do to the amount of centripetal force? It goes up by a factor of four. four. So if any small changes in your velocity make a huge impact on that centripetal force because it's squared. Kyle? What is underneath that? It's That's pointing to. Yes. Yeah. That whole thing. That's a radius. That's the radius. So yeah, the radius that's mv squared. squared over r. Oh, that's mv squared. I thought, I thought the r was. No, 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 it's v squared over r. Uh, you really should work on it's, it's Fc equals. You know, if you have room for a So here, yeah, I've got v, do you see v squared up? Yeah, well, yes. I see that. It's the exact same thing. I, okay, I see that now, but it doesn't look the exact same. How would it be different? That's, oh, I get it now. All right. Fc equals. Yeah, tell totally, me, Mr. Taylor. Mac. Okay. Mac equals what? Now. Mac equals mv squared over r. Oh. Now let's revisit an equation <laughs> that we had way back in unit one. Okay. And we were talking about the sun orbiting the earth, right? So if I swing this thing around and I want to figure out its speed, in other words, I want to know how fast it's going. I don't care about direction. I just want to know how fast it's moving. What can I measure? I can measure two things. Time. Time and? Acceleration. No. Distance. Well, what distance? Is it three? Radius? Mm, not, I can measure the radius, I right? That's what I said, and you looked at me like, what are, what are you saying? No, you I went, I, I, Kendra, yes, I did. And then he goes, he goes, Kendra, oh. sure you did, Kendra. I said circumference. No, I said radius. I'm Somebody back here. Sure I'm talking about circumference on camera. Okay, we'll see it. We'll okay. wait for it. I can hear you. So, Neither did the rest of the class, so it's just funny. Okay. No, Liz heard me. Liz heard me. So here's this rubber stop moving around. Measuring the radius, let's say, let's say that that's, I don't know, a half a meter. If that's my radius, what can I find? Your diameter. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yes. Your circumference. I can find the circumference, which is <laughs> 2 pi r, right? Watch that. Now, I'm going to write this as 2 pi r because I don't want to use That's diameter. Okay, That's I want to lose it as 2 pi r. Then, so this is going to be, this is going to give me the distance that it's going to take to go around. Then I'm going to divide that by uppercase t, which is period, which is the time for one complete revolution. Okay? So, if you have this information, this is how you're going to get your velocity. Take the circumference and divide it by the time for one revolution. Don't flip out and say, oh my god, that's, that's a new equation. No, we've used this before a lot. Okay? All it is is 2 pi r over t. That's it. Now, this is where we're going to do a little bit of weird substitution. So we said centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So now, we're going to take that 2 pi r over t and substitute it in here for velocity. So then we're going to have 2 pi r over t squared divided by r. So, me, when I square all of this, what do I get? And no, 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 just this. Just me. Just look at here. <laughs> 2 pi r okay. over 2 pi r squared is going to give me what? 4 pi squared. Yeah, it's going to give me 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. I'm going to divide all that by r. It's kind of a pirate thing. R. So, I get an r squared and an r, right? So, what's going to happen? R. Uh, One of them's going to kiss. I'm going to lose an r. Okay. <laughs> so then I get 4 pi r. squared r over <laughs> t squared. Now, do I still get the units for centripetal for, for any acceleration? 
Well, yeah. 4 pi squared r is going to give me what? Meter. Meters. Now here I'm going to have seconds. I'm going to have meters per second squared. Hey, life is cool. Okay. All right. So that's what's on that sheet. So you can either have centripetal acceleration equals v squared over r, or you can have 4 pi squared r over Wait, so squared. It's the exact same thing. If you don't have the velocity. Yeah. So if if so on this velocity, so let's say. You're out in the parking lot and you're driving around in a circle and you look at your, down at your speedometer and your speedometer is reading 20 miles an hour or 20 meters per second, let's say. That's your speed. That's how fast you're going. You measure the radius of the circle. There's your R. Boom. There you go. Now, if you've got this where you're saying, okay, hey, I want to move something around in a circle. And you really can't measure the velocity, but you can measure the radius and how long it takes to move around in a circle, then you go that route. Okay? So it just depends upon what you've got. And so it's one rotation for this equation. Yes. That's the time for one complete rotation around that point. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quarter, or a nickel in this case, and I'll put it on here. And I'm going to make it spin. Okay? So is that nickel undergoing centripetal acceleration? As this thing is moving around in a circle, yep. is it undergoing centripetal acceleration? Yeah. Yes, because it's moving in a circle. It doesn't want to move in a circle, right? It wants to move in a straight line. So what's holding it in place? What's it forcing it to move in a circle? It's either I've got a little string attached to it, there's a gravitational source in the middle of this thing, or there's friction. friction. So let's go with friction. Okay? So if you look at friction, so here's this nickel moving around in a circle like this. So here's the deal. There are three forces acting on that nickel as it's moving around in a circle. There's three forces. Three. Mm -hmm. Mr. Taylor, what's one of them? Oh. What? <laughs> yeah. Three forces? There's three forces. Dude, you can't get one. <laughs> that, that's make it a little bit easier to see. So I'll, I'll use the green spinny yeah. thing. Okay? So I'm putting it on here, right? It's moving around in a circle on the earth. Oh, so it's going straight line. Okay. Yeah. So what's one of them? Acting which way? Bingo. There's my centrifugal force. FC works. Okay. What else is there? Gravitation. Brooklyn, what's another one? Friction is what's creating the centripetal force. So that one's already been taken. Wait, what did you say? Gravity. Gravity! Okay. There's two, there's one more. It's not worth force. Huh? It's not worth force. Your <laughs> force. <laughs> Normal no. force. Normal force. Normal force. Normal force. Normal force. Okay. Now, here's the deal. When the, if this thing goes around and there's no friction, so let's say it's going around like this and I shut off the frictional force, what's the nickel going to do? It's flying. It goes flying. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. Mu equaling force friction over. <laughs> Force so we're going to get a little clever with this. The frictional force is what's creating the centripetal force. That's what's making it move in a circle. So I'm going to do a little substitution in here of centripetal force. Now, we're on a flat surface. So on a flat surface, force normal is the same as your? FG. As FG. Okay. So then we can even get a little bit more clever here and go, oh, centripetal force is mass times centripetal acceleration. <clears throat> Fg is mg. So if you wanted to get clever, you could also look at mu as being a ratio of your centripetal acceleration to g. There you go. Now, there's a limit to what friction can do. So if I take this quarter on here, 
and I spin it, if I go faster and faster and faster, it eventually flies off into the drain. Into the drain. Okay? Lowest potential energy source. So goes flying off. Oh, speaking of that, I have a joke. No. <laughs> okay. Now, imagine this. Like it. Oh, I don't want to see that. I'm going to take another coin. Uh, I have to have another quarter, another nickel. So I'm going to put one here, one here. So I'm going to, I'm going to move them right now at a constant speed. Okay, they're still accelerating, but it's at a constant speed. Which nickel is traveling fastest? The one on the outside, the one on the inside, or are they traveling at the same speed? Outside. Why? Because, well, maybe. You know, outside, because that's it the might be outside. Outside. It's it's But do they both take the same amount of time to go around? Yes. Yes, yeah. 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 so T is the same for both of them. But the one on the outside has to travel faster. faster. So if you've ever done, or imagine like a marching line in a band, and you're trying to walk around and, and maintain a straight line, the person on the outside is going to have to walk faster. much faster. The person on the inside doesn't have to move as fast because they don't have to travel as great a distance in the same amount of time. The person on the outside has to haul the mail because of the fact that they have to travel a much greater distance. No. Okay. So here's the deal. So as I speed this up, which one's going to fly off first? The outside one or the inside one? The outside one. The outside one will, right? Why? Mathematically, why? Oh, because you change its velocity just a little bit. So why don't you change it out a little bit? So if you put it directly in the middle, will it just stay? Yeah, it'll just stay. Because it's already rolling. So here's the deal. Do both nickels have the exact same value of T? Yes. Yes. So the one that has the bigger radius requires a greater centripetal acceleration. Therefore, that requires more force. Friction can only provide so much force. The one on the outside goes flying off first. Got it? Good? Grant? Okay. Okay. Now, basically the front page is one problem. So, here's the setup. James. You've got Betty Joe and Bobby Joe are in the marching band. Walking around. Now, pay attention to the fact that every number I have given you has three significant digits. Every answer on problem number one better have three significant digits. We've gone over this a number of times. I'm not going to put up with it, okay? I don't want eight digits. I don't want one digit. I want three digits. It's not a radical concept, okay? So basically, you're going to find the velocity of Betty, the velocity of Bobby, centripetal acceleration of Betty, centripetal acceleration of Bobby, got the masses, figure out the centripetal force, calculate the coefficient of friction, okay? Now, on the back side, you've got a runner, you've got a velocity, just use the V squared over R. You have the velocity, you have the radius, boom, there are the numbers. Uh, on number three, I've given you the coefficient of friction of 1.05, got the mass of the car, there's the radius, how much frictional force, which is the same as the centripetal force is needed for the car to make the turn, maximum velocity. Now, when you get to problem number six, let me lay out the problem on number six. So imagine that you've got this ball 1.8 meters above the ground, okay? So I'm like this, 1.8 meters above the ground, okay? Here's my height. I'm swinging it in a horizontal circle. I'm going to let go of it, okay? And it's going to travel a certain distance through the air before it lands. So this is basically a lemming problem. So one way to calculate the velocity is to figure out how far it travels, just like a lemming problem. So imagine this point where I let go of it is the cliff. It's going to travel a certain distance. So you can figure out how long it's in the air, 
you know how far it's going, you can figure out how fast it had to be moving to travel that distance. Then go back and plug that into your centripetal force equations. So on when you get to problem number six, work it first as a lemming problem, and then find your Vx, and then plug that into your centripetal force equations. Okay? All right. Not known.